I have uh, been playing the organ since I was nine years old. And I started off as a theater organist. And then, of course, I did all my classic studies and did my master's degree and doctorate uh, studies at the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. And, and, and within that, of course, was beginning to play in churches uh, by a very young age. Um, by 10, I was playing mass. And between uh, the, the playing theater organ uh, at a young age in pizza parlors and, you know, big old silent movie houses and playing in church, uh, I feel uh, I got a little warped <laughs> in how I view the organ. Uh, and well, that'll do playing organ will do that to you anyway. <laughs> But. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I I always had this side feeling about the instrument that uh, at times in our classical world of organ, um, we, we tend to maybe even subconsciously uh, and accidentally uh, lose touch with folks uh, who are listening to the instrument, that the instrument can sound uh, funeral-esque. Um, in, in somber, uh, even in our most grand literature, uh, it can sometimes lose normal music listeners, even musicians uh, that aren't organists. And so I've always had this this thing in me as a kid that that enjoyed making people excited uh, when they heard the organ or surprised uh, mm -hmm. because they got a perspective of the instrument that didn't fit their their preconceived notion of what the instrument is supposed to sound like or what it's supposed to do or what music it plays or where it plays or th those kinds of things. So um, really uh, in, in the early 2000s, I found my way actually back onto uh, the theater organ and I, and I had done everything I could possibly do to run away from the theater organ when I really became intensely involved in the classic organ and, and the church instrument, if you will, because it was, I, I realized very early on that being a theater organist uh, drug at my clout as an organist oh, yeah. in, in, sure. in, in the world of organists and in, in, the, in the American Guild of Organists and, and whatnot. And it, 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 it became damaging uh, when somebody knew I, I had that skill, to be honest. Um, so I got very quiet about it for many years. I didn't play the theater organ from age 18 uh, all the way to 2007. I had uh, started playing the theater organ again in, in like 2007, and I just got booked to do a few concerts because there were folks in Colorado who still knew I did that. And I was very hesitant uh, at that time to get back on the theater organ bench. Nonetheless, I did. And and I, I realized that though I hadn't done that in a long time, I just had a blast. It just kind of awakened this sense of, wow, I can really bust out and do different things with this other instrument sure. again. And, and not only that, but because I had all the, this training as the classical organist over all these years prior, suddenly I was a monster on the theater organ. And I, in a, I was playing it in ways that I never had uh, when I was much younger. And, and that just kind of shook me in my foundations again with the organ and, and reminded me that this is an instrument that gets put in the corner too often. And then in the mid, uh, uh, right around the mid 2000s again, uh, maybe earlier 2000s, I started to discover organs that were highly, highly MIDI capable, uh, musical instrument, digital sure, interface. Yeah. And, and at that time, you know, admittedly, you know, some of the sounds still weren't real quality. Like, you, you know, you just, you, well, you could- the sound sampling wasn't what it is. Right, and you could hear the imperfection. Yeah. And, and so it wasn't terribly uh, tempting to me yet. It, it, was, it was kind of fun. You know, you could mess with a piece and add, you know, some strings or something and do something that just kind of added some fun, but you know, it wasn't, it just didn't feel legitimate to me yet. But over the last, especially last 10 years, uh, the, the quality of, of sound sampling and, and creation and, and output in uh, many of the digital instruments, really, especially Rogers instruments, in my opinion, 
uh, and their modules and their capabilities of working with MIDI in, in terms of how they integrate MIDI in working with the organ. Hmm. Uh, in other words, seamlessly, just like all the stops, you know, in pistons and whatnot, is so smooth that it it really just kind of started to drag me in and say, try something with this. And and where it really started, there's a church in Denver here called South Broadway Christian, and they they were one of the first to install one of these big instruments with the latest, at that time, yeah. uh, MIDI technology. And they asked me to come and play a Halloween concert um, about 10 years ago now. And, and I thought, well, okay, that'll be fun. I'll play a Halloween concert. And, and I thought, well, you know, this instrument has some weird possibilities. I might be able to have a little fun. I mean, it's Halloween, so I didn't have to take that too seriously. It could make it a fun concert. And, um, and, and that began my real, real delve into using the organ in different ways and um, using MIDI technology in a very high manner. I found myself gravitating towards orchestral works, yeah. uh, true, mm. great orchestral works. And so uh, this program this week will actually feature Mussorgsky's Night on Bald Mountain, uh, uh, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, uh, there's even an old arrangement uh, by Porter Heaps and Lloyd Nolan that was called Swinging Bach, and it's it was for Hammonds a uh, long time ago. And it's kind of kitschy, and and it has a Beguine section, and it has a jazz section, and kind of a big band section. But it was written to be played on Hammonds in, the, in the, probably around the 50s or maybe even 60s. The drawbar organs. Right, right, on drawbar organs. And I thought, well, why not orchestrate this and make this a blast? And hmm. so... I'm literally uh, making this an orchestration for that piece in it. And it's grand. It makes the, it, it's a, it's a total tongue in cheek presentation of Bach staccato and D minor. Now you, you're playing this recital at First Plymouth Congregational. And uh, well, I see you, you're playing my, my piece, Takata and Boogie. Yes. The, the uh, first, first person I know of to play this Takata. From, from American Suite. Well, it's very awesome. And and let me tell you how it found its way into the program, too. Um, the program starts with Night on Bald Mountain, which is out and out orchest orchestral and sounds orchestral. And then I play Cesar Franck's Chorale in A Minor, um, which has very Toccata-like elements uh, at the in, in spots of the music. It starts off with... Right, with it. And, uh, and so it kind of has those elements, and it's a grand piece ending, uh, of course, in A minor, but the, or A major, actually, on the A major chord. But the the point was, well, how do I get now out of this kind of, because I wanted to get to Porter Heaps and Lloyd Nolan's Toccata, which is very tongue-in-cheek, almost humorous. I mean, it had very light and fluffy piece. And I thought, how how am I going to get from from Franck to, to this other piece, which is literally humorous? And your Toccata and Boogie, I had remembered, uh, has a sense of legitimacy uh, in traditional organ scoring, yet fun and and a bit of that poking at just a little bit of maybe outside the envelope with a little bit of fun and a little smile uh, that we don't typically think about with organ music. And so I thought, well, that's a great transition piece because it'll it'll have seriousness and clout about serious organ music, and yet it will start to push us out of thinking that the organ can't do wild and maybe funny things even. So there was kind of a thread in you know, packaging this so that the listener hears the organ at the very beginning doing orchestral music classic orchestral music, but yet nonetheless not organ music and taking the listener through very legitimate music and maybe some even humor in just the first half alone. Let's, uh, let's listen to Tejada and Boogie. Yes. Well, I, I find the piece tremendously fun. I love the, the big chunky chords. Uh, in juxtaposition, um, in the playfulness of the piece, uh, and somehow holding the fact that this is a piece of organ music of seriousness, all at the same time. That's why I really like the piece. It has it, got character which can allow the listener to go beyond what we think of the organ, and yet present some fun through rhythm and boogie, which is not a term we would ever think about with the organ. And yet it's so good, it's so 
full of life. You know, it's a dance. And that pedal solo right there is great. I'm 32 foot boogie. <laughs> this must be a triumph of yours of sorts to be asked to come back and play the organ that you designed. And... I'm very excited about it. it, it it's, it's been so nice. Uh, this is actually the second time in my life where I got to... Uh, last time I consulted for a, a large organ uh, was, a, was a big tracker organ in, in Kentucky. Um, built by Fritz Nowak, mm. and it, it was a stunning instrument. Um, but I literally helped des design the instrument and signed off on the contract and left before it even came. Um, and I got to go back and dedicate that instrument too, but I didn't lead one Sunday worship on it. It, 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 it kind of stuck with me for years. Um, so it was nice. I did have the instrument at First Plymouth under my hands for about a year and a half. But it is really wonderful to come back and do the rededication of the instrument because it, it is a grand instrument, a, a really wonderful instrument, and the potentials are just massive. Well, we're with Frank Perko III. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I call you FP3. I, it's great. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I love my third. So it's very important to me, and I've actually had other people call me FP3. It's just great to have you here.